Hello, everyone. My name is Brennan Marr. That noise you're hearing is my ventilator. And welcome to Page Turners They Were Not, my Star Wars podcast. Well, my friends, the 40th anniversary of The Empire Strikes Back is upon us. My favorite Star Wars film. The best Star Wars film, in my opinion. And perhaps the best sequel ever made. Save, in the opinion of some, for The Godfather Part 2. Now, I'm going to confess, I think The Empire Strikes Back is a better sequel than Godfather Part 2, but that's only in terms of personal preference. That is not to say, or to try to argue, that Empire is a better film than Godfather Part 2. I would have to give that serious thought. But regardless, I do think it is one of the best sequels ever made. And has become the benchmark of sequels. Now, if three years ago, I thought that the American Film Institute would give us a 20th anniversary list of the top 100 American movies. If that had happened, which it did not, I would argue that The Empire Strikes Back deserves to be on that list. Now, to be fair, it does not deserve to be higher than the original film. Star Wars is number 13 on the 10th anniversary list of the AFI. If they had made a 20th anniversary list, I would argue that Star Wars should be moved higher, arguably into the top 10. But uh, some of the movies that are in the top 10 are pretty darn good. So, you know, that one I'd have to really think about. But I do think The Empire Strikes Back should deserve consideration. Now, it's a list. It doesn't really mean that much. But when it comes to the greatest American films, I do believe that The Empire Strikes Back is one of the best. So let's talk about two things. The legacy in the short term and the legacy in the long term. Let's talk about the short-term legacy of The Empire Strikes Back. The Empire Strikes Back came out at a turning point in American film history. Beginning in the late 60s with the success of The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, and Easy Rider, Hollywood entered a new era now known as New Hollywood in which a new generation of up-and-coming filmmakers, Francis Ford Coppola, Steven Spielberg, Martin Scorsese, Ryan De Palma, Woody Allen, Robert Altman, Peter Bogdanovich, William Friedkin, and, of course, George Lucas. This began what is called New Hollywood with a new vision of very profitable films that broke all the rules that were allowed an artistic freedom that had not been allowed before and were able to reflect the attitudes of the era. Uh, An era of rebellion and counterculture. These movies, above all, were profitable. So the studios were content to allow these filmmakers to pursue their visions. As long as it was raking in the money, that's all that mattered. Now, in 1980, several things happened. 
first off, and most famously, Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate failed spectacularly at the box office. It was a film that cost $40 million to make. It made $3 million in theaters. Yeah. It was a huge flop. And besides being a flop, it was lacerated by the critics. Lambasted. You know all the reviews about Cats that came out recently? All, all the reviewers of Cats were trying to almost one-up each other in, in derision of the film. That is exactly what happened to Heaven's Gate. Now, I have seen Heaven's Gate. I saw it recently. And I know that it went down in history as one of the worst movies ever made. You know what? I watched it, and in my own opinion, it is not that bad. In fact, I kind of liked it. I didn't see what all the derision was about, personally. Okay. Now, that being said, the movie failed spectacularly. The director, Michael Tremino, was an auteur in every sense of the word. In fact, apparently he was a pain in the neck to work with. The James Cameron of his time. Um, but because the movie failed, his career plummeted. And more than that, he personally became the subject of much derision. And his controlling attitude as an auteur was blamed for the failure of the movie. Hollywood took note and realized that the time had come to pull the plug on auteurs being allowed to run wild. Auteurs like Spielberg, Lucas, etc. So ever since that time, about 1980, we have been living in a half-and-half half world where half of the major movies are auteur films and half are studio-driven films. Now, a lot of the auteurish cinema of New Hollywood continued till about 1983 when it was Heaven's Gate that brought it crashing to a halt. So that's the one big thing that happened at that time. The end of New Hollywood, the end of auteur American cinema. Or at least the end of auteur cinema dominating the theaters. There is still a lot of auteur cinema to this day. Also in 1980, of course, The Empire Strikes Back was released. Becoming the most successful sequel financially uh, of all time and beginning the era of sequelitis, as I like to call it. The 80s was an era of sequels, but not sequels that were handled with a lot of care in some cases. You know, you got sequels to movies that just kind of got progressively worse. Or, or just lots of sequels that just piled on top of each other. For example, Lethal Weapon had a lot of sequels. Beverly Hills Cop had a lot of sequels. Bad movies like Cannonball Run had sequels. Um, and then, you, of course, you get all the slasher films. 
Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. Sequels, sequels, sequels. And if you think that there are sequels today, look back at the 80s. So we get that. Another short-term result of The Empire Strikes Back is the rise of the 80s fantasy film. Sometimes I like to call them creature features. They involve a lot of creature effects. With the success of The Empire Strikes Back, which is a fantasy. It's a fantasy. There were not necessarily a lot of great... I mean, there were some. But there were a lot of crappy science fiction films in the 80s. But when it comes to fantasy, there were a lot of crappy fantasy films. But I think that, in my own opinion, The Empire Strikes Back had a bigger effect on fantasy than on science fiction. Um, With the success of The Empire Strikes Back, you've got a slew of fantasy-related movies which was further propelled by the success of Conan the Barbarian. The 80s gave us a lot of movies like Dragon Slayer, Willow, Legend, uh, Beastmaster, um, even Return of the Jedi to a certain degree is one of those, those movies. Just an endless parade of fantasy films of the 80s. Which are, a lot of them have achieved cult status. And I think that a lot of these movies came out because The Empire Strikes Back was so successful. And the idea of making these fantasy films... And I mean, let's face it, a lot of them were Conan the Barbarian riffoffs. But nonetheless, they had a certain charm to them in the 80s. And there are many, many more, many that I'm sure I'm forgetting. Movies like The Dark Crystal, like Labyrinth, and just so on and so forth of these marvelous, with a slight edge of 80s cheese, fantasy films. And I can't help but think that that was a result of the success of The Empire Strikes Back. Sequelitis, 80s fantasy films, and the rise of franchises. That's Hollywood's chief moneymaker. Those, I believe, are the short-term effects of The Empire Strikes Back. Okay, we're going to take a break to hear about our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll talk about the long-term effects. See you in a moment. Hello there, this is Brennan Marr, host of Page Turners, They Were Not, a Star Wars podcast. And I'm here to tell you about Anchor. Anchor is the best way to make a podcast. Why is that? Well, first off, it's free. Yes, you heard me right. Anchor is free. Anchor has all the tools you need to make a podcast. From your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you on various platforms. Including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can make money from the podcast. And get this, with no minimum listenership. That means you can make money even if no one listens to your podcast. That, of course, is not ideal, as Anchor will allow you to spread your podcast. Bring in more viewers, and you can make more money because of it. Everything you need to make a podcast is in one place on Anchor. If you're interested, download the free Anchor app 
or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you, and may the force be with you. Okay, that was a word about our sponsor. Okay, long-term effects of the Empire Strikes Back. Well, let's deal with the big one first. If the Empire Strikes Back had not been successful, that would have been the end of Star Wars. Now, obviously, if it if it if it was not financially successful, that would be the end. Now, if it had been financially successful, but had not been good or well received, I should say, then you know, sayonara to good Star Wars. And they probably would have continued to make sequels. But I think people would have lost interest. Um, Well, though, to be fair, I mean, if they had kept coming and it kept making money, obviously that means that people are still interested. But I think that if it had not been a well-received movie by audiences, then the original Star Wars would be considered it would be like Pirates of the Caribbean where it's like the first one's great but the others were a little bit more meh to a lot of people. Star Wars almost would have been a one and done kind of thing. But I mean it's hard to imagine that because we live in a world where it is so successful. It's hard to imagine what it would be like if it had not been. Now if it had not been financially successful, then the original film would be considered a one and done kind of that was a great little movie. And that would have kind of been it. Now a lot was writing on the Empire Strikes Back, I think. To really succeed and keep the story going. And in fact, may I be so bold as to say that if The Empire Strikes Back had not been well-received, had not made money, the original Star Wars film would not be in the conversation of the greatest American movies. That's a bold statement. I know. It would have been considered a novelty that everybody flocked to and everybody liked and had a good time. And, you know, wasn't that... That was a great movie, wasn't that? That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's say... Let's examine the American Film Institute list. Star Wars is near the top ten. In my mind, there is no way it's even on that list without The Empire Strikes Back. It's a very bold statement. Or at least it would not be it would not be as highly placed on the list. I do think it would still find a place. Because it was a phenomenon that nobody had ever seen. And I think The Empire Strikes Back, like a good sequel, recontextualizes the previous entry. So we see The Empire Strikes Back and we examine the original film through the lens of The Empire Strikes Back. Let me give you an example. Darth Vader. Darth Vader is kind of a stock villain in the original movie. He looks cool. We get a bit of backstory. He shows up, does some neat stuff, says some ponderous lines, has a cool voice. That's it. That's all he is. Right? The Empire Strikes Back comes out and makes Vader 
a great movie villain. And as a result, when we watch the original film, we are thinking of Vader as seen in The Empire Strikes Back. So he becomes even more awesome to us. And, of course, the great revelation, the biggest revelation in movie twist, plot twist of all time, we are looking at the original film with the knowledge that, oh, that's Luke's dad. Okay? That makes Star Wars the story of Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader. So in the long term, without The Empire Strikes Back, I do not believe that Star Wars would be considered one of the great properties of all time. Nor do I think the original movie would be considered one of the greatest movies of all time without The Empire Strikes Back. By the way, the American Film Institute has a list of the top villains. Vader is number three. His appearance in The Empire Strikes Back is the movie that the AFI points to as what movie makes him one of the greatest villains of all time. So that's just one example. Vader, we look at him completely differently because of The Empire Strikes Back. Also, here we are now, just having seen Episode 9. 11 Star Wars films. 12 if you count the Clone Wars. All of these movies do not exist without The Empire Strikes Back, I think. And heaven forbid if if they had never made a sequel to Star Wars. Then, you know, Star Wars would be like, oh, yeah, that film, that was pretty cool. So here we are as a result. And by the way, all the Star Wars properties, all the Star Wars movies, all the Star Wars movies that have come out since... The Empire Strikes Back are building off that line. No, I am your father. I honestly believe that that line, that moment is the reason why Star Wars is continued. In fact, without that line, you get no prequels. Without the prequels, you get no sequels. You know, without that line, you don't get the Clone Wars. That's it. Everything since that line. Everything since has been building off that line. So Star Wars in the long term as a franchise does not exist without The Empire Strikes Back, I believe. What else? It also turned, as I mentioned, Hollywood's attention to sequels and franchises. Something that continues to this day. Which also was helped along by other successful franchises like The Lord of the Rings in the early 2000s. And we're just leapfrogging off of Star Wars. And here we are now the success of the MCU, the success of the Dark Knight trilogy, and other things are keeping the idea of sequels going. Now, a lot of people mistakenly believe that the new Hollywood of the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s was about art for art's sake. That is not true. It was propelled by the almighty dollar. It was propelled by money. Those movies made lots of money. And that's why Hollywood allowed the directors 
to make the movies they wanted because they knew those movies would make money. The Empire Strikes Back comes along and makes lots of money as a sequel. Sequels become the way of the future that has lasted for 40 years. And now, to conclude, The Empire Strikes Back is the benchmark for sequels, by which we judge all sequels. You often hear people say, this is The Empire Strikes Back of this series. And there are movies that, in my opinion, take cues from Empire in doing what Empire did, which is to take the story and make it deeper, darker, explore the characters, and make an ultimately more meaningful product. That, to me, is what a good sequel should do. The Dark Knight did this. Uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes did this. The Captain America the Winter Soldier did this. Arguably, The Lord of the Rings the Two Towers did this. Arguably, though that one's a little bit different. Uh, Terminator 2, you can argue, might have done that. Though that was already pretty dark to begin with. And others that are probably too numerous to think of. Even Toy Story 2 to a degree. So that's really a sign of the power of the Empire Strikes Back. The original film is a benchmark by which we judge movies that tell the hero's journey. And other fantasy fairy tale type movies. The Empire Strikes Back is the benchmark by which we judge all sequels. And a truly great sequel is considered The Empire Strikes Back of its series. So there is so much more that we could say for this 40th anniversary. There's so much more that I could talk about, but we could talk for hours on this subject. So I'd just like to say happy 40th anniversary, Empire Strikes Back. Thank you, George Lucas. Thank you, Lawrence Kasdan. Thank you, Irvin Kirshner. Irvin Kirshner directed The Empire Strikes Back, and I do not believe that he gets enough credit. He is a master filmmaker here. Which is odd, because a lot of the other movies he made weren't really that good. (laughs) To be fair, but, you know, but he made a really astonishingly good movie. Lawrence Kasdan, Gary Kurtz, the producer. Lawrence Kasdan, because he co-wrote the screenplay with George Lucas. Irving Kirshner for directing. A lot of the actors for really giving some fine performances. Arguably, this movie has better acting than the original. In fact, I think most fans would agree that The Empire Strikes Back has much better acting than the original movie. Much better writing probably helped, and much better directing. And Yoda, I mean, we there's so much we could just say about him. Thank you, Frank Oz, for really bringing this character to life. And if anybody says puppeteers aren't actors, they got another thing coming. <laughs> there are so many people we can thank, but I just like to give big thanks to this movie. It is my second favorite film of all time. Behind Lawrence Arabia. It's my favorite sequel. It's my favorite Star Wars film. And in my opinion, the best Star Wars film. Okay, my name is Brendan Marr. That noise you're hearing is my ventilator. And have fun today celebrating Empire Strikes Back. Thank you for tuning in to Page Turners. They were not my Star Wars podcast. May the force be with you.